So we watched the, the other video on the 10 like weirdest or ugliest items that Mad Season Show had. And it made me think like, dude, there's so many cool items in WoW. I wish Mad Season had a video of like really cool items. And then uh, Taylor linked this video, 10 very rare and unique items in WoW. And I'm like, oh, cool, let's watch this. So uh, without further ado, Mad Seasons, 10 very rare and unique items in WoW. Okay, let's check it out. Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here, back Hi, with Season another Czar video here. for you. People enjoyed the last rare items video I made, so I'm back with round two. In this video, I'll show you 10 more super rare items in the game, and I'll also share the story and the history behind them and explain why they're so rare. Keep in mind, as the title says, this list will include items that are no longer obtainable. Just throwing that out there since some people have a problem with that. The basic criteria I try to keep is that the item had to have been in a player's inventory at one point or another. And another thing is that this list isn't really in a super strict order, but I'll try to save the best for last. Ooh. First up, we have the Haunted Memento. Okay, yeah, I know this, this was tied one. to the old yeah. Scourge Invasion event that kicked off the original Nexramus raid. Undead enemies would spawn throughout the world, including the outskirts of capital cities, and you got rewarded with various things if you fought them off. The Haunted Memento was dropped by these mobs, and if you had it in your inventory, a ghostly shade would follow you wherever you went. So, it was pretty common back in the day, but due to it being a unique item and the source being cut off 11 years ago, the supply has dwindled a bit. It's now highly sought after by collectors, and you can pick one up on the auction house occasionally, but due to their rarity, they go for hundreds and thousands of gold. The shade doesn't do anything, of course, it's just a <laughs> cosmetic thing pretty much. It's a classic item, and it even has a toy referencing it that you can get from the Darkwind Fair. Next up, we have the original level 60 Warblades of the Hakari. These aren't badass, super rare, yeah. which is why I have them pretty early on in the list, but they're quite unique and cool, which makes up for it in my book. And, the supply has been cut off, so they are rare to some degree. You got these from the original Zulgarub instance from the final boss, Hakkar the Soul Flayer. I always liked weapons that sheathed on your back. Like when I played retail and I farmed transmogs, I always tried to farm the transmog the, with the weapons that sheath on the back versus the, on, the, on the side, right? I just thought it looked really cool. They're actually part of a set which is quite unique. If you have both of them equipped, you get some haste rating and the yellow text reads forged in the seething flames of hatred. Another interesting thing about them is that they sheath on the back, which is kind of unique, and they have a default purple glow to them. These are no longer obtainable since the raid was re-released during the Cataclysm expansion, so it's fairly rare to see people running around with them these days. They were reincarnated with the Cataclysm version, but they were turned into daggers instead. They're probably my favorite set of swords in the game, at least out of the ones that I own. So, like I said, not the rarest, but interesting enough to share, I thought. For items 3 and 4 on our list, we're visiting the Ultiman instance again. Like I said in the previous video, this dungeon is a treasure trove of rare items. The reason for this is when Cataclysm was released, the levels of all of the mobs in most of the dungeons were altered. And the way the BOE loot drops work is mobs have to be within a certain level of the level of that item. So, in vanilla, these items could drop from nearly any mob in the instance. It was still a very low chance, but multiplied much more than it is now. After Cataclysm and the level changes, only a few mobs were left to still be in that range. So, for a lot of these items, the amount of eligible mobs went from hundreds to ten, five, or even one in some cases. And, that's the case with their next item, the Miner's Hat of the Deep. Hmm. This is the only black Miner's Hat in the game, and it's up there on the list of the rarest items that are still obtainable. The only place it's been confirmed to drop is the final chest at the end of the instance, so to farm it, you have to go through the entirety of the instance every time. And the drop rate is very, very low. Huh, like, less that. than 0.01% people have speculated. Wow. There are currently only four up across every US server, and it goes for an upwards of 4.5 million gold. Holy crap! So, if you do get it, whatever you do, don't vendor it. The other ultimate drop I wanted to bring up is the jackhammer. You, you know someone like got that and like had no idea what they stumbled upon and just like vendored it or like equipped it and then never logged in again. You know, like just like, oh, whatever, and then kind of went from there. <laughs> yeah. You may remember in the previous episode, I brought up the Pendulum of Doom. Well, this is its little brother. This is a two-handed mace, and before it was changed, it had a lightning fast 2.5 speed. And it also had a 30% attack speed proc, and combining that with its already fast speed gave you the fastest two-handed swings possible. It wasn't an ideal twinking weapon unfortunately though, because it required level 40, which was of course oh, just yeah. outside the 30 to 39 bracket. So, because of that, not a lot of people held on to it, which makes it more rare these days. In fact, it hasn't been seen on any US server's auction house since August 6, 2015. The person who sold it had no idea of its value and sold it for just 100 gold. 
There hasn't been any confirmed drops in quite some time, so no one knows if it's even possible to loot it anymore. Oh, wow. But if by some miracle you do happen to pick it up, you're in for a lot of gold, or a hundred gold at least. <laughs> Next up, we have Rockdalar and Lockdalar, the old purple hunter weapon set. Yeah, super in right. the Molten Core Raid from the Major Damo Executus fight, there is a chance to loot something called an Ancient Petrified Leaf. This wasn't a piece of gear, but rather a quest starter that sent you on a very difficult series of challenges, and at the end of it, you were awarded with the Rockdalar Bow, the Lockdalar Staff, and an 18 slot bag that held ammo and gave you 15% attack speed back when ammo bags were a thing. It required you to kill 4 different demons at 4 corners of the world solo. If you had friends, a pet, or even a random stranger trying to help you, the mobs would despawn and you would have to start all over. It was quite the challenge, and each boss had specific strategies, and if you didn't use potion or other random gadgets, you would be hard pressed to complete it during that raid tier. This was the stave portion of the quest, which gave you Lockdalar. As for the bow, you I, I think one of my favorite things about Classic, and I've said this so many times, is that end game quests have you traverse the rest of the world. So if you're an end game level 60 player, you're going to be running across the world, not on a flying mount, not flying over it, and not flying to just end game zones or a brand new continent like in TBC or Wrath. And by the way, those were great expansions too. But you're no, you're in Northrend. You're no longer in Azeroth. But what was so special about Classic is that in Azeroth, players are leveling up and experiencing the game for the first time at like level 26 or something and you see a level 60 running by not just doing nothing doing a level like doing level 60 content through the same zones those level 25s or level 35s and stranglethorn veil or whatever are actually running through and that's just cool i feel like later and later expansions you just see less and less of that because the high levels are off in their own zones doing their own thing you never see them anymore and they're flying so you wouldn't see them even if they were in the old zones because they were flying overhead and you would never notice they were even there but see, having zones feel populated because high level players have to traverse the low level zones to get to the high level quests made the world always feel meaningful and alive you just had to kill a nixia and loot an item called the black dragon sinew so, nothing too challenging there, as most guilds had her on farm by the time they were killing Executus. The last part awarded the Quiver, and it required you to loot a Blue Dragon Sinew from either Azurgos at a 100% rate, or some Winter Spring Dragons at a much smaller rate. The Leaf, and therefore the quests, were removed when the Cataclysm expansion came out, and because of that, it's pretty rare to see any hunters walking around with these weapons. Next up, while we're on the subject of special class Such quests, cool we weapon. had the Anathema and Benediction Staves for Priests. These were the rewards for combining a few items together, the Splinter of Nordrassel and the Eyes of Divinity and... Someone in the chat made a good point. It gives the lower levels a nice goal. When you're like level 40 or level 30 and you see someone run by on like, with like an epic mount and epic gear and you inspect them and, and, and you just see every... like It's just like, wow, I want to do that and achieve that. It gives the low level players something to aspire towards when they see that versus just seeing nothing in the world and then it's just like, okay, whatever. So not only is it more social, but it gives people something to strive for. And yeah, this, I mean, of course, this is such an iconic weapon, which I've never actually wielded myself. I, I kind of want to make a priest in classic just to like get this weapon. It's just so rad. Shadow. The Eye of Divinity you looted from Executus's chest again, and the Eye of Shadow had a very small chance to drop from various demons in Winter Spring or the Blasted Lands, including the outside raid boss, Lord Kazakh. The Eye of Shadow was also bind on equip, which made it very lucrative in the auction house as well. Once you had both of these trinkets, as a priest you could talk to an NPC in the Eastern Plaguelands that gave you a challenge quest to save some peasants from the undead. There does exist some footage of this, but none that I own. I'll have a link in the description if you're curious though. So, as a reward for this, you got the staves. They were a little unique because they were the same staff, and you can switch forms by using them. Benediction was for healing, and Anathema was for all of the Shadow Priests. They look really slick even to this day, and you guessed it, the ability to obtain them was removed when Cataclysm was released. And next up, we'll end our special class quests with the original Kul Sarar. This one was actually for two classes, the Warrior and Paladin, but due to the way vanilla worked back then, it was primarily used by warriors since they were really the only effective tanks for the most part. From the Dyrmal instance, the bosses had a chance to drop a book called Four's Compendium of Dragon Slaying. This gave you a quest to where you talk to an NPC named Lorekeeper Lydros inside of the library of the dungeon, and he'll show you an elven blade that had lost its power. You could bring life back into the weapon however, and you did this by having Anixia breathe fire on the blade. This allowed you to pick up an item called the Heated Ancient Blade that had just a 20 minute duration, so, during that short time interval, you had to defeat Anixia and use this sword on her corpse. 
doing so would give you the treated ancient blade, and if you brought that back to the lore keeper, you would finally be awarded with Kul Sarar. This was the ultimate tanking weapon for a time, and while it has been re-released, the original level 60 weapon is held by a select few. The ability to get it was removed in patch 3.2.2 during the Wrath of the Lich King, where a level 80 version was re-released along with the revamped Anixia. Next up, we have Atish or Atish if you prefer. I covered this- Guys, one's in the chat for Atish, two's in the chat for Atish. I, I used to say Atish, and then everyone was like, Zara, you're an idiot, it's Atish, and now I say Atish, and then every time I say Atish, people are like, Zara, you're an idiot, it's Atish. I'm like, there's no winning here, man, there's no winning. I, I, I don't know. I feel like Atiash sounds cooler, but Atish might be more accurate. Uh, who knows? This in a recent video, but it does fit this list as it is quite rare. This was the caster legendary for vanilla. It was usable by mages, warlocks, druids, and priests. To get it, you had to loot 40 items called Splinters of Atiash from the original Naxxramas 40 man raid, and if you combined them, you would get an item called the Frame of Atiash, which then gave you a quest to obtain the head and the base of the staff. The base dropped from Cthune, the final boss of the AQ-40 raid, and the head dropped from Kel'Thuzad himself, the final boss of Nexramis. So, it was very very challenging at the time, and the amount of guilds capable of killing both of those bosses was quite low. After you finished that part, you constructed the staff, but it was still corrupted and you had to cleanse it. To do that, you brought it to the Stratholm instance, and you fought a special demon boss there. Oh, this cool. boss also dropped that. a legendary sword halfway through the battle, but it had a limited duration and it was only usable in Stratholm. Oh, the majority okay. of the people who completed this came after the next expansion was released, the Burning Crusade. Right, yeah. It was still fairly challenging since you were only 10 levels above it, but obviously much more doable. The ability to obtain this staff was removed when the Wrath of the Lich King expansion launched due to Nexramus being re-released. And lore-wise, it now sits in the hands of the Archmage, Khadgar. And since we're talking about Nexramus anyways, another rare weapon is the Corrupted Ashbringer. Of course. This dropped off of the Four Horsemen fight at a fairly low rate. This was the final boss of the military quarter, or what was called the Death Knight Wing back then. One of the four horsemen in the original was High Lord Alexandros Mograine, commonly known as the Ashbringer. He was one of the leaders of the Silver Hand, and he was eventually murdered by his son, Renault Mograine. His death corrupted the once holy weapon, giving it an undead appearance, and it became his weapon in the afterlife. This was one of the harder fights in the raid, so it was rarely seen until just like Atiash, people leveled to 70 and started rolling through the raid. And similar to Atish, the ability to obtain it was removed when Nexramus was re-released. This is because- Does Four Horsemen just like, always mean something else to you guys now? From Hardcore. Like, it for, to me it's just always something else when I look at this boss, man. <laughs> yeah, it's just, oh, yeah, it's just always gonna be that grief now, man. Judgment Day, yeah. As Mograine was replaced by Baron Rivendare, so no Mograine, no Ashbringer. The neat thing about this weapon though for those who have it is that it's of epic quality and therefore transmogable. There are a few people out there who have it and it's always a head turner for me. Yeah, There is a nod is to this so weapon cool. with one of the Paladin Ashbringer artifact skins, but in my opinion the original still looks better. Oh way better, yeah. And lastly for this episode, I wanted to talk about Murky. Any pet collectors out there know exactly what's coming. This is considered the holy grail of pets. You got this from the very first BlizzCon back in 2005, and for attending it you got not only the murky pet, but even a beta key for the next expansion, the Burning Crusade. So, being the very first BlizzCon, no one knew that you would actually get some free stuff with it. There have been some other murloc pets over time, which diminished its value in a way, but this was the first and the rarest by far. Huh. Some people did hang on to keys, knowing that they could make some money off it down the line, and you can see it being sold on websites such as eBay for thousands of dollars. Huh. Obviously, I don't recommend that though, since any real life currency trade is against the TOS. But it's still pretty crazy. So- Wait, is buying a spectral tiger off of eBay technically against the rules? I never thought about that. Cause it's like a physical card that you're buying in the trading card game that Blizzard launched. Of course they're gonna there's gonna be an aftermarket. It's against the rules? How does that work? Yes, you go straight to jail. Dude, but but there's trading card game. It's a trading card game. You're selling the physical card. What do they expect people to do? Not sell, like, think about any other card game, like baseball cards, Yu-Gi-Oh cards, Pokemon cards. Of course, people are buying, selling, trading. That's the whole point of it. TCG's fine, but the loot codes for m the murky one is not fine? I feel like it's not against TOS, because it's a physical item. Yeah, I don't know. Don't take it from me, but 
it's I, I never thought about buying and selling spectral tigers is against the rules that's just a card game i don't know that about covers it for this episode like i said in the last video tons of rare items i missed i'm sure but can't get to all of them in one video and as the title says these are just rare items not the rarest on that note though if you want to go ahead and give me suggestions and stuff i missed i might put it into the next one Thanks in advance and let me know if you want to see more stuff like this. I hope you found the video interesting, like it if you liked it, and thanks for watching. Peace. Awesome vid. Thank you for linking it, Taylor. There we go. Uh, well, you hopped quickly. It's not against the rules to sell the cards, but it's against the rules to buy an account for the mount. Yeah, not, not, not the account itself. The cards. I, I think in the video, he was talking about the cards, not the account.